بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. All right. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm board certified in internal medicine and addiction medicine. I run a consult service at Stanford Hospital, uh, treating people with addiction in the hospital Monday through Friday, all day. And basically, what we do is we do interventions on people who come to the hospital with a medical complication of their addiction or their substance use, um, and we link them to treatment, talk to their families, so on and so forth. Um, I also teach at the I'm faculty at the School of Medicine, so I teach about addiction as well. Um, and cannabis use amongst the youth is an important topic that we should uh, discuss, and I'm so happy to see so many people come out to talk about that. I wanted to start with a story about Zaid, 14-year-old Zaid. Zaid grew up, he was a good kid. His parents made all the right decisions. Uh, preschool was thought about karate and Boy Scouts and taking him to the halakas. And he was a very respectful and likable kid. As he grew up um, and started to enter into his teen years, his parents, um, the relationship evolved. He was a teenager. They felt that their relationship wasn't as transparent as it was before. And sometimes they had a feeling that they didn't really have a pulse of what was going on in Zaid's mind or that that relationship was as open as it was previously. He was a teenager. Um, and then they found out about a friend of his that was smoking cannabis or smoking weed and they started to get concerned and on further examination they find that the friend isn't much different than Zayd. So the question arises in their mind, if this could happen to Zayd's friend, couldn't it happen to Zayd? And is they that risk? And then really the real question that I would like to open up and address is what can we do to protect against this and prevent against this? The good news is, is this has been studied a lot. And uh, what I'm going to start talking about is preventative uh, measures we can take to prevent cannabis use in our youth. So this is basically based on a summary of 60 plus studies and a report by the Department of Health, the United States Department of Health, which looked at how do we prevent cannabis use amongst the youth. And they used a model where they looked at societal factors, community factors, relationship factors, and individual factors. And they took these 60 plus studies, which by the way, the studies followed youth and looked at their cannabis use or lack of cannabis use and looked at, well, what were the features that were involved with them using cannabis and what were the protective factors that were behind people, not kids not using cannabis. And so I, I like the model and I, I think it'd, it'd be really helpful to use. So just starting on a societal level. Okay. So just starting on a societal level, what they defined as a societal level is culture, laws, and policies, media, and access. And as we know, especially in our state and in, in the U.S., laws and policies around cannabis are rapidly evolving. Uh, and then the culture um, in our society has um, a lot to do with how we perceive cannabis use. So just starting off, just looking at the nation as a whole and where we're at, drug overdose deaths are a national problem and epidemic. We're, um, we're breaking records every year. Drug overdose deaths are now the leading cause of death in people under 50. So it's younger people, relatively. And 
Um, this is from the latest data in 2017 showing that 72,000 people died of drug overdose deaths. A lot of this is obviously driven by harder drugs, but as we know, cannabis, marijuana is use usually precedes harder drugs. And although you can't overdose, there's no reports of overdose with teens and adults with cannabis. Still something that is very important to think about. And then we look at the United States, the legalization the, um, of medical marijuana and now recreational marijuana. If you look at the green states, those are the cannabis states where medical marijuana is legalized. It's kind of surprising to see how many places are actually legalized. And then the bright green states are where recreational use is also legalized in addition to the medical use. And if you look at California, it's really green. It's bright green. Um, and, um, and we think about what kind of messages our kids are receiving when something like this is legalized and then they drive down the highway and they see an advertisement like this. Um, goodbye anxiety. So how does this affect our youth and how has this affected our youth in the past? Well, we know that when the perceived risk of cannabis or marijuana use goes down, that the use of marijuana goes up. And we know this from our past history in the U.S. So one example of this is between, in the 70s basically, the perceived harm of marijuana decreased, studies showed, and then that was followed by a sharp increase of cannabis use. And then what happened after that is 1979, media started giving a lot of attention towards the increased rates of marijuana use. And then attitudes and beliefs shifted and things improved over the next decade. So good example of how perceived risk changes use patterns amongst our youth. And obviously legalization sends a strong message to our youth. Um, Another example of this is in the early 90s, perceived risk started to drop again. And then in 93, there was a sharp increase in use. And that was... Parents hear about from the state sister that there's some rumors going on around school or perhaps a parent um, mentioned to Zaid's parent that Zayd is a bad influence on their parent, so on and so forth. The scenarios um, are uh, various. And by the way, this isn't a real uh, person. It's just an example that I'm using. I wouldn't use a, um, uh, an example of a real person uh, who confided in me. But it's an example of that's made up of some of the common features that I see amongst uh, Muslim teens that are affected by this. Um, so the question arises again, what can we do to protect this on a practical level in our homes? And when I say protect against this, protect against this, I don't necessarily mean protect against starting cannabis use, but also the progression of cannabis use. So the way we look at the starting of marijuana use to addiction, we look at it like a spectrum. So on one side, you have people being exposed to, to, to marijuana, and then there's like an experimentation phase where they may try it, and then there's an escalation phase where they're starting to decide that this is something, the, the benefits outweigh the risks in their mind. Um, and then they escalate, you know, then they escalate, and then they go to a regular pattern of use. And from a regular pattern of use, we go to a loss of control, which we call addiction. So when I say prevention, this includes preventing our kids from starting this use. This includes, once the use has started, to prevent escalation of the use. And, um, and then all the way to a loss of control. So all of this can be used in all these scenarios. So looking at relationship factors, um, 
that are protective against cannabis use or factors that are associated with cannabis use. Relationships between parents, family, peers. So the study looked at frequent family meals and family dinners and found this to be a protective factor um, for against cannabis use. They also looked at adequate home environments. What this was was the availability of reading materials, frequency of television watching, discipline tactics, and the less adequate homes were risk uh, were at risk. Kids from there were at risk of cannabis use. Uh, it was a factor associated with cannabis use. And then parental monitoring, being connected with your child, parents' knowledge of child's activity. So it was a good idea to, when children come home from school, just to touch base um, and have a conversation and not jump to judgment when we hear something that's a little strange for us or um, alarming for us so that we can keep that dialogue going on and those lines of communication open. Also, I looked at parental closeness and quality and found that that was a protective factor. Um, and this was interesting. This is very interesting, I think very pertinent for us. They looked at parental expectations and they looked at children who are more involved in U.S. culture than their parents. They specifically looked at um, Hispanic culture and they found that children who are more sort of into American culture than their parents, um, this was a factor associated with use. Um, and then, so those are home and parents and this, this is um, protective factors amongst peers. So friends' spirituality, um, and then risk factors are peer substance use and deviant behaviors of peers. And this is kind of common sense. And um, I know this is a lot of sort of information, so I'm going to wrap this up in about five, five, ten minutes or so. Um, and then feel free to ask questions. Actually, feel free to stop me and ask questions now if you'd like. Um, so how do you bring up cannabis use amongst with your kids. It's a difficult conversation to broach and bring up. For starters, refraining from judgment, having an empathic approach, recognizing their unique situation and context which they live in is a lot different than the context that we grew up in. Even generationally, if we grew up here in this country, it's very different 30, 40 years ago, and the cannabis is very different. Um, cannabis in the 70s and 80s was 5% THC. Now it's 25% THC. Now they have synthetic can uh, cannabinoids, which are like K2 and spice, and these are hundreds of times stronger than the 25% THC, the strong cannabis we have now. People are having seizures and strokes. Um, this is where you see in the media like zombie-like uh, people um, and these really strange behaviors. Anyway, so. You know, recognizing that this is, this is um, they're coming from a unique perspective and a unique context and trying to understand that unique context that they're living in. And then here's a, also a good point that I found helpful in my, in my work as well with, with kids. There's this questionnaire that's used uh, that the pediatric societies recommend, and it's kind of a way to bring this topic up with kids who can be guarded about this. The first question they ask is not, have you done cannabis, which can be kind of direct. They'll ask something like, have you ever driven in a car with somebody who smoked marijuana? And it's good to start with that to sort of slowly ease your way into the conversation. Any friends? Do you have any friends that use marijuana? And the chances are they may be a little bit more open about that. And the goal is to assist your child in making better decisions, well-informed decisions and keep the dialogue going. Individual protective factors and risk factors. So we went over societal, community, relationships, which we have a lot of control over optimizing, and then individual risk factors. So belief about positive consequences of cannabis, we touched on already. This is interesting, perceived rejection, bullying, and shyness, modesty is important. But shyness and not being able to assert ourselves or have the refusal skills, tobacco use is a risk factor. And this is, I thought, interesting. Irregular or no religious participation 
and importance of religion. I thought it was interesting because they came to the same conclusions that we come to, and it wasn't a religious sort of study. Um, but the conclusion that spirituality and the importance of religion are factors. I included that table so you knew I wasn't making it up. And I thought it would be a little bit more convincing. So this is the table from the actual summary of findings from the report. And it's a little bit messy, so I'm just going to ask you to forget about the black part and look at the two left columns, or rather the highlighted columns, the highlighted column. And those are the protective factors in these studies. And they were looking at the odds of marijuana use, marijuana use, initiation and persistence of marijuana use. And they found in these studies religiosity, religious involvement, importance of religion were all important protective factors. Um, and then risk factors uh, were irre irregular or no religious participation, so on and so forth. All right, and I wanted to add a little bit about exercise because I think this is important and this is, this is a part of youth um, experience anyway, just to get a little back up to continue doing that. Exercise has been shown to help uh, prevent substance use. High levels of physical activity predict lower levels of illicit drug use as kids grow up. Um, and they did an interesting study where they looked at animals and got them addicted to drugs. And, or they started looking at animals' drug use when they had laboratory rats, when they had access to drugs, and they split them up into two groups. Both of them had access to drugs. They looked at the group, um, they added a running wheel to one group, and they found that the exercising group that had access to drugs initiated drug use slower and escalated slower. Um, so it, it's interesting because it's just looking at, on a biological level, the effects of exercise. All right, so this is a lot of sort of data and information. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a doctor, I can't help it. Um, studies and all these facts. I'm gonna try to bring it all together in a few moments and um, talk about how this was practically implemented. There's the Iceland model of prevention programs um, and it was very successful. So it's really important to see how they were able to do that. They had a problem with substance use in their in their, um, in their youth. And so the community came together, all the stakeholders, all the people who could um, work on this came together, and they focused on reducing known risk factors, and they strengthened the protective factors. And they included exercise, participation in sports, but they also included strategies to improve parental engagement with their children. And then thirdly, they implemented extracurricular activities that had these protective factors included within them. And what did they find? Um, so they, they, if you look at 1998, um, that's substance use. It's really high amongst, uh, green specifically is, um, is uh, hashish, marijuana. And uh, if you look, the substance use slowly went down as they implemented these prevention tactics. Um, so they work, and I think it's really important for us to use this in our, um, in our homes, in our lives, and try to optimize them as much as possible. Because we're, we are in... Um, times where this is becoming more prevalent. All right, so back to the story. So now Zaid's 17 years old, and there was, if you remember, he grew up as a likable kid, parents made all the right decisions, all the uh, Islamic gatherings, and then as he entered into his, to his teenage years, there was less of a connection between parents and, and child because as a teenager, less transparency, less communication. And then there was a whiff of an idea of perhaps his friends using cannabis, and then another thought of perhaps him using some cannabis, and then now he's 17. And um, 
his school performance declines, new set of friends, staying out late, found using cannabis at school, or some consequence inevitably happens with regular substance use. There's some loss of control. And then he continues to use despite being confronted by his parents. There's promises, promises are broken, so on and so forth. And then so what we would call that, that loss of control is addiction and that can happen with cannabis. And this is a, maybe a little bit more of a specific problem. Um, so I'll just breeze over this. Um, essentially treatment for that is a little bit more involved than just sort of containing it at home and focusing on protective factors. Professional help is incredibly important. It's a very complex issue that requires a lot of support and counseling. Um, and, and family therapy is what's been studied most for adolescent substance use that's getting out of control or heavy. And um, it's the most studied modality. And the idea is that family relationships are related to the development or at least the maintenance of substance use and addressing that dynamic in the, in, in the, is important with the help of, of a professional. And then, and then all their forms of therapy, um, and I think we'll end as that. So then, so back to story time, therapies recommended to the family and the inevitable answer is, uh, we don't do therapy or we don't do groups. Uh, the cycle continues and, um, the family kind of gets put through the ringer, and then they're a little bit more motivated to try professional help. They learn how to set limits, stop enabling substance use, and they have the support and guidance of a professional. Zade gets some structured help, works on himself, mood improves. And one phenomenon that I see in our Muslim population and just regular spiritual transformation often mirrors the recovery from substance use problems, it's, it happens. As people start to work on themselves and start to see improvements, they inevitably start incorporating um, the power of and transformative aspect of Islam as well. And um, Zayd becomes a happy uh, adult, 20-year-old, and family is closer as a result. And that's... And that's the end. Um, inshallah, I think we're going to make a transition between me and Sheikh Harami and then have a discussion after that. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Um, so I'm going to give the similar talk to what I presented to the youth. Um, and what I was asked about was to speak about the Islamic standpoint of marijuana. Now we could easily just say it's haram, closed case, that's it. Don't use it, don't use it, and that's it. But that's simplifying a very complex issue. And the complex issue is the reality that marijuana does exist in our society, and it's existed in our societies as Muslims for a long time. The scholars have been dealing with this for about six or 700 years. The early Muslims did not have an exposure to marijuana, but the later, later generations, especially as they went into other lands, had an exposure to marijuana and they named it by different names, but it's the same plant, early versions of what is available today. And so they discussed it. Um, and I want to mention a, a little bit of what they say, but we, the, the point of where they got the prohibition of marijuana is there is no mention of it in the Quran or in the Hadith, but there are other things that are mentioned in, in, the, in, in the Quran and in the Hadith, and this is where they draw it from. And it's really important to understand it, not just at the level of, okay, this is a ruling, there's a fatwa, says it's haram, and then that's it. Because if we as individuals, if we just reduce our Islam to just, oh, the Shaykh said it's haram, and that's, that's it. I don't have to think beyond that. Then you're going to get another person who says, well, I have a Shaykh that said it's haram. Just out of curiosity, has anybody ever heard of the fatwas that say marijuana is not haram? Show of hands. One, two, keep them up high. One, two, three, on the sister side. Okay, so we have a few. So they are out there. And this is something that we have to realize that, that in previous times, maybe some of those obscure fatwas, they would not have had the impact that they have today. But now, because of the prevalence of marijuana, and the ease, the, the ease to access it, 
the, our youth who are exposed to it, if they're going to, some people are like, I don't care if it's, okay, it is haram, I'm going to use it. But then there's other people who are going to try to justify the use of it, and they're going to dig up those obscure fetwas. So as parents, as uncles, as family members, as community members, as youth halaqa leaders, we really have to understand what is the reasoning behind any difference that may exist so that we can properly address it. The other thing is that people have misconceptions about, about marijuana and the effects of marijuana, and so they'll say, well, you know, marijuana is not a drug. Anybody, who's heard somebody say that marijuana is not a drug? Show of hands. One, two, three, four. More hands went up in there. So what does that tell you? That rhetoric is amongst the youth, they're saying, oh, marijuana is not a drug. Marijuana won't harm you. Marijuana doesn't affect the intellect. Marijuana, you know, is, and as uh, Brother Munir had mentioned at the beginning, you know, there are people that will try to justify the use, use of marijuana. So we have to go back and say, okay, what is it that Islam or our deen says about marijuana? So when, we, when the Muslims were first exposed to marijuana, what do you think their minds went to in the Quran to find an answer? Where did they go? What, what portion of the Quran? What's that? Intoxication, thank you. Intoxicants, khamar, right? Khamar, which is mentioned in the Quran. Well, other intoxicants are not mentioned in the Quran. So, uh, khamar, according to the Arabs, was made out of very specific things. They, they had very specific things that they used to make intoxicant drinks out of. They would make it out of dates, out of grapes, out of pomegranates, out of honey, out of barley, and a few things. Well, as Muslims from other lands came and started being uh, uh, learning about Islam, when they heard khamar and they understood the definition according to that one group, then they would ask that they asked the Prophet ﷺ, like a group came from Yemen, and they said, we have a drink that's made out of such and such, some other thing. Is that haram? And then he said in the famous hadith, kullu muskirin haram. Everything that intoxicates you is haram. So what does this do? What is this teaching us? It's teaching us the reasoning or the reasons behind the rulings, which is very important because we're not going to get caught up on just a, um, a, a few words and then um, try to wiggle our, wiggle our way out of, the, um, uh, out of the ruling. So as an example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made pork haram in the Qur'an. But what word does he use in the Qur'an when he makes pork haram? What does he say? What's that? Lahm al khanzir The flesh of the khanzir. So what did some people do? In modern times, I've heard this, they make stew out of, uh, these are of course deviant people who are not really uh, trying to sincerely follow the religion, they're trying to wiggle their way out. They make stews out of pork bones. Like they'll take the bone of the animal and say, well, Allah said the flesh of the animal, not the bones. That, does that make sense? But you can see where somebody's trying to like get down to the letter of the law. Well, the Prophet Wasallam had told us about this, that people would be, that had done this even before. And he said, there were people who when the, when, when, when the flesh of the khinzir, when the pig was made haram, what did they do? They started eating the shaham, the lard. Like, well, that's not meat. And then when that was made prohibited, prohibited to them, they started selling it and then taking the money and using the money. Says, so, well, it doesn't say anything. But the idea is, if that, that thing is, if that thing is haram, stay away from it. it. That thing, anything associated with it, anything that falls under that category, and anything that supports it. So when the Prophet ﷺ made the drinking of alcohol haram prohibited, what else did he make haram? The growing of the grapes, the pressing of the grapes, the carrying of the grapes, the one who makes it into alcohol, the one who sells it, the one who buys it, the one who drinks it, and the one who witnesses the contract. It's like everything associated with this is haram because this is an intoxicant. Now, when other people would bring new types of intoxicants, he said everything that is a muskir, that is an intoxicant, is haram to kind of nip it in the bud. The other thing is, and this is also some, well, no pun intended, um, nip it in the bud. But anyway, um, the other thing is that some people, and this is a, um, um, a line of reasoning that people will use to start people on marijuana, well, they, they will say, oh, just take a puff, it won't hurt you. One puff. Has anybody ever heard, like actually somebody say, don't worry, one puff won't hurt you. Anybody have, uh, raise of hands. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. A lot more hands went up over there. Again, what is that telling us? They're exposed to it. Um, just today, I had a high schooler come up to me and he, he, he shared with me that he actually asked his parents to take him out of public high school, a public high school here in the Bay Area, to take him out of public high school because every time he went into the bathroom, he always saw people smoking marijuana, using other drugs, and offering it to him. Because one of the, one of the aspects, one of the elements of uh, using intoxicants is that people don't want to do it alone. They want other people along with them. In fact, the Arabs have specific names for a drinking buddy. Does anybody know, happen to know what it is? Al-Munadim. That's a name, not only, that's, that's not my friend, that's my drinking buddy. So they would have specific names uh, uh, for that. So people will, will, will offer it to him, say, hey, don't worry, it's just a puff, it won't hurt you. Well, some people presented this argument to the Prophet What if we just, okay, Khamar is, 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 uh, is prohibited. And, but what if we just take a sip, a sip that will not intoxicate us? So he said in the famous hadith that if a, um, uh, a large amount, al-farq, if a large amount, which is a, um, a, a type of measure, and some people say it's about 96 liters, so that's a lot of alcohol. If he says it would take you almost 100 liters to get drunk, فَمِلْءُدْ كَسْئِ مِنْهُ حَرَامٌ A handful is haram. Does that make sense? So what he's doing there is he's cutting off it's cutting off the gateway into that, that thing. So the idea is not this, the khamar that intoxicates you. It's haram because it intoxicates you, but also all the gateway to it is also haram as well. So now, but I don't only want to go into the, 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 the issue of intoxicants from the prohibition from the sign of intoxicants. I want to actually read the ayah because the Arabs, we also have to remember the Arabs really loved alcohol. They really loved it. And out of, it, out of curiosity, does anybody, and some of the Sahaba, when Islam uh, first began and alcohol was still permitted, some of the Sahaba actually continued to drink. Some of the great Sahaba that we talk about now, and we say, they continued to drink. And then when it became prohibited, they stopped, of course. In fact, at one point, there were two people, or there were some people carrying uh, containers of alcohol, and when they heard the ayah that prohibited it, they dropped, they opened their arms, they dropped the, the containers of alcohol, and they dropped to the floor and, and, and broke it. So, uh, when, when the sharia was, was being revealed, alcohol was permitted. Intoxicants were, uh, were permitted. Then, it was, it was mentioned that just don't come to the salah wa antum sukara. Don't come to the prayer while you're intoxicated. And then the ayah came that says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, innam al-khamru wa al-maysaru wa al-ansabu wa al-islamu rijnum min amal al-shaytan, fajtaribu. That khamar, intoxicants, and gambling, the various form of gambling, are evil, are filthy, from filthy works of the shaytan, so stay away from it. And this was the final ayah. But just as an interesting point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions gambling and Alcohol in the same ayah. What similarities do we see between the two? What's that? Addiction. It's the issue of addiction. And so we have to look at marijuana as it's presented in society. Not just, oh, that's haram, stay away from it. But to understand addiction. And that's why it's very important the work that Dr. Ahmed and others like him are doing in the field of addictions within the Muslim community so that we just don't we don't, when our youth are exposed to it, or to marijuana or any other form of drugs or alcohol, we don't just say, haram, stay away from it. We have to understand addiction, and we have to address it. And so when the Prophet when the ayah talks about the prohibition of khamar, it also talks about gambling, which gambling has an addiction in some cases that's harder to get rid of than the addiction to heroin. It's a very, very hard and debilitating addiction. When the Prophet ﷺ spoke about the, uh, the addict, um, and he actually used the, the word abd, the slave of khamar, he also mentioned two other addictions in that hadith. The abd of dinar, the slave of money. People are sometimes addicted to worldly things. And then he even mentioned the person who was an addict, an addict to clothes. 
So he was addressing at that time. And then in another hadith, he talks about the addict of zina, the person who's addicted to zina in, in all of its forms. So this, the idea of addiction and the prohibition of these things is also because they're addictive in nature and they tend towards addiction. And so we should stay away from them. Even if a person might say, oh, one puff is, uh, is not an issue or it's just one scratcher, right? I'm just going to have one scratcher. And out of curiosity, has anybody ever heard of a Muslim who plays some of those? Oh, I'm just going to use the nickel slot um, in Vegas or I'm going to just use a scratcher. And if I get, and if I do win the money, I'm going to. See, the logic is there. Well, the, the, the interesting thing that I found about gambling is that at the time of the Sahaba, the gambling that Allah is prohibiting, the Qurayshi Arab gamblers, you know what they used to do? They gambled for the love of gambling, not for the money. They would take whatever they win and they give it to the poor. That was their gambling. And that's what Allah is saying is haram. So the same idea of, oh, I'll gamble and give it to the poor, that's what the Quraysh were doing anyway. They would gamble for the fun of it, for the thrill of it, and then if they did win, they would give it to the poor. So it's important to understand the context of these rulings and where they came from because the same type of logic is, is repeating itself. So Allah mentions gambling and alcohol in the same uh, ayah. The hadith mentions alcohol along with other types of uh, addiction. So we have to understand the addiction. And then the ayah goes on to say, إِنَّمَا يُرِدُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَنْ يُقْعَ بَيْنَكُمْ الْعَدَاوَةُ وَالْبَغْضَاءُ That the shaytan wants to sow between you the seeds of enmity and hate. Does anybody know the, um, how many murders in the U.S. are committed under the influence of alcohol? 40%. Isn't that what Allah is talking about? The adawa? Sexual assaults and rapes under the influence of alcohol? 40%. 40%. Now, again, we're speaking about marijuana, but it's important to understand the reasonings behind why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, um, is uh, prohibiting these things. Now, one of the responses to that is that, well, you know, most people, they might commit crimes under the influence of alcohol, but we, if you smoke it, it's actually going to mellow you out and chill you out and you're not going to commit crimes. But that's not the only reason behind it. There's the issue of addiction. There's the inter issue of intoxication, your ability to, to, to reason and think. And, but it does open up other, other doors. We've heard of stories of many stories of people who went to smoke weed and it led them, it was a gateway to other things, whether it's theft or whether it's zina or whether it's gambling or whatever it might be. It was a gateway leading them to something else. And that's why they refer to in Modern literature, marijuana is a gateway drug. So it opens up the door to things. So there's the issue of intoxication. There's the issue of harm to self. There's plenty of literature, data and research showing through longitudinal studies, showing the impact, the harms of marijuana on the, the self, even though people might want to say, oh, it, it, it doesn't harm you. Um, the reality is that it does, and it does affect brain development. So when people are being offered marijuana, which I think, and I'm not, you don't, don't quote me on this, but I think the average age that people are offered marijuana is about 12 or 13. So what grade is that? Seventh, eighth grade. So just consider that your middle school children, youth, they may be adults by Sharia standards, your middle schoolers have either been offered, have tried, have been exposed to, I've heard about people talking about it. Most probably, the reality, that's the reality. It's not, don't think, oh, my, that's not my son uh, or my daughter. Um, and the other thing is to, 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 to think about that if a person, like when you want to discuss this with your children, and you should have that, that, that relationship, that open relationship, to be able to discuss it. You should be able to discuss these issues with them and clarify things and not just say, oh, haram, don't even talk about it. Because what is that going to create? If you create this shutdown and you don't allow discussion, it's going to create a per cause a person to hide. Now, one of the things that I recently found out from one of our youth in the community who is struggling with a marijuana addiction, um, it, and I didn't know this, is that one of the ways that parents used to be able to tell if their kids are smoking marijuana is what? The smell. It stinks. In fact, some people, I think they call it stank or dank, you know, like this stinks. The weed actually stinks. But you know how they've gotten around it now? Thinking. 
And now that it's legal recreationally, they can buy the, the little packets and they'll have a 21-year-old person or above, because you have to be 21-year-old to buy it, and they're filtering it down to, to the young people. Each person tax on a few extra dollars, so he's buying it at whatever, and, and, and you know, trickle down economics, um, and then gives it to the next person. So uh, they could actually be smoking and come into the masjid high, or smoking in the parking lot. There was one person who was struggling with addiction, she, sister, and... Um, she saw some people, not at uh, this masjid, but at a masjid, and she, uh, she asked some people uh, who were, or she, she knew about some of the youth who were smoking it, and she asked them not to smoke it around the masjid. So at least she has that, like, she had that uh, uh, idea of, like, okay, it's, it's wrong, we shouldn't do it, but definitely not around the masjid. So it is happening, um, and what I, and I know the issue is about to start, this is what I'll end. I wanted to go into the idea of medical marijuana. Did Dr. Ahmed speak about medical marijuana? Okay, not much. Well, from the Sharia aspect, the, the use of intoxicants, whether it's alcohol or other things, was discussed. The, the Quran. What does Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tell us about alcohol? He says that there is a, there is a, there is harm, but there is also benefit. But the harm outweighs the benefit. So, is there, are there medicinal uses for alcohol? Yes, but the Quran is saying, don't use it. The Prophet ﷺ found one of his uh, one of the companions, one of the mothers of the believers, Um Salama. She had actually treated her daughter with with wine, and when the Prophet ﷺ found out about it, he was angry about it, and he and she said, "But it's a treatment. I'm not giving it to her for the intoxication purpose. I'm giving it to her as a treatment for a stomach ailment." And so he said that Allah, in a famous hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not placed the shifa, the healing of our ummah in what Allah has made forbidden, uh, uh, forbidden of it. And so this is the hadith that a lot of the scholars use to say no, that you're going to have to find another healing. And we've been promised by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that if there is a healing benefit in alcohol, Allah has something else out there that you can get a similar benefit from that's uh, without having to use the alcohol. So when people talk about medical use of marijuana, they should think about that. With that said, the scholars have approved for use of alcohol, opium, other types of you know uh, opioids, uh, uh, any type of like things that would affect the intellect. Anesthesia doesn't that affect the intellect, right? You're not going to be able to think reasonably if you get like the the, the gas at the dentist or at the uh, uh, at the, the, uh, the surgery, but those things have been permitted out of, out of necessity, and so there is room for certain things to be permitted for medical use of marijuana, but it would have to, we would ha it would have to be analyzed. First of all, make sure that it's only the, 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 the if, it's, if it has the CBD oil, which the majority of the medicinal purposes are in that, that's what the person would have to use. If the, if the doctors and the FDA and everybody's saying, no, there's actually, we found a uh, benefit in the other type, the marijuana with the THC still in it, which is the, the psychoactive uh, portion of it, then you would have to uh, see if that is actually uh, stands up. If it's doctor recommended, there is, the FDA has approved for certain, uh, for seizure treatment, uh, cancer patients, and it's mostly pain management. So there's the element of pain management, and there's also the issue of, um, of, a, of actual treatment. Is it for pain or is it for treatment? That has to be, be looked at. But it's not that just any person can just say, oh, I have a backache and, I'm, and, it, and it's, I'm, I'm going to use marijuana, so I'm going to get a card and start smoking it. It has to be under the care of a phys physician who can recommend to this person and who can actually say, I understand your concern, your religious concern, that you don't want to use it. And so I'm giving you the recommendation based on that. Does that make sense? That it's not a doctor saying, oh yeah, no worry, go ahead, use it. There are doctors like that. There are doctors who will say, just use it, that's fine. No, we have to say, does the medical research show that marijuana, that not the CBD, the THC that will affect the intellect, in this specific case, in this amount, will actually be a treatment, and there's no alternative, and this is the best treatment. You see, there's a whole process behind that. Um, but these are things that we should be aware of because it might be a tool of... Um, justification that people would use for, uh, for, for for starting to use marijuana. And I know it's 8 o'clock, so uh, we'll, it, we'll leave the, the remainder of the talk till after Isha um, and have the, um, um, uh, the question and answers. Um, and there was...
I think that's that's about it. So Jazakumullah khair, and we'll have the remainder of the questions after Salat al Isha. Jazakumullah khair. So the youth are heading in here right now. We'll have Azan. Just a reminder that we'll stay in this room. Uh, uh, the teens, uh, the youth will be coming in this room as well. And we're going to have a joint session, uh, uh, combined session, and Dr. Rani will be moderating, and Dr. Uh, Amr and Sheikh Rami will be here. So Jazakumullah khair. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Assalamu alaikum. I don't need to do what the kids do, right? Assalamu alaikum. All right. Bismillah ar rahim wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'een. I hope, inshallah, this has been a beneficial program for everybody that's attended. Thank you so much to Dr. Ahmed Rahimullah, who is my colleague at Stanford, and we're really blessed to have him there. Um, he is an internal medicine doctor and an addiction specialist. And uh, Sheikh Rami, as all of you know, who is our youth director here at the MCC and one of our scholars in the Bay Area. And also to the Khalil Center, who is um, co-sponsoring this event and if those of you who are not familiar with the Khalil Center, it is a counseling, professional counseling center that is specifically designated to work with the Muslim community and integrates aspects of Islamic spirituality into the counseling process. There is actually a branch of the Khalil Center right here in the MCC, as well as in other cities like Santa Clara and um, Union City. So inshallah, I hope you guys benefit from this program. What this portion of the discussion is going to be is really asking Sheikh Rami, Dr. Ahmed, their perspectives and talking to both the adults and the youth. And then we're going to then have kind of an open forum of discussion on uh, really questions to see what kind of discussion happened back and forth and what we can help really solidify in terms of knowledge relating to this topic on addiction and marijuana specifically. I heard actually a series of questions coming out of the room, both from the adult side and from the youth side. And I think there's still room to really make sure we understand this topic fully I think there's still a little bit of discussion to be done. So I'll start off actually with asking Dr. Ahmed to share with us his perspectives on speaking to both adult side and then also the youth, and we'll do the same for Sheikh Rami. I found it a very enlightening experience. You know, I look at a lot of numbers, and I kind of presented a lot of numbers. So sorry to do that. But um, I found it very enlightening to see that be reflected in my conversations with the youth. Uh, they were very courageous in speaking up and talking about their experiences. And I'll say that what we spoke about with the adults um, is reflected in what we're seeing when I, when I saw the youth kind of raise their hand about what they're seeing amongst their peers. Um, so I think we should really be vigilant about this as a problem and recognize that as a Muslim community, we're not immune to the problems that exist in the broader community. And just like we're not immune to it, we should probably um, protect against it and also engage in the treatments that have been proven to um, help if it does become a problem. But yeah, there's a lot that they're facing with. I think it's important for us to become aware of it. I'm an addiction medicine Doctor, I do this on a daily basis, Monday through Friday. It was enlightening for me to see. Um, you know, I see things in the news and I read things in papers. But when you really hear it from, from our youth, and it's, this is my first time at this masjid, it's such a very vibrant and endearing youth that we have in this community. MashaAllah. Um, may Allah protect us all. Um, it, it's, it's enlightening to see what they're going through. And I think, yeah, absolutely. I think we should start devising ways of how we can protect them against this and be aware of it. Alhamdulillah. Uh, well, my reflections are similar to what Dr. Ahmed, and we had not coordinated this, but the hand raising, um, when I asked questions, a lot more went up over there, right? 
And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we, in terms of the, the you know, the um, um, the reasoning behind, oh, it's okay, don't worry, you know, how many have been offered? A lot more on the youth side. So they're facing that a lot more uh, than 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 the than the older uh, generation and but what I what I what I what really my main reflection is just look around how many people have come out for this event and to me this is really really a, a healthy sign of the community that the community is interested in having this discussion and I think the masjid is the perfect place to have this discussion because that's where we're all congregating we're all we're all coming to the masjid and so we should not shy away from having this discussion in the masjid. There are some people who um, who might feel like, oh, it's a problem outside, but we should be able to have this conversation here. One of the things that I didn't get to mention in, in my talk on both sides, or I mentioned a little bit with the youth, but that we should, um, in addressing the issue of addiction, recognize that it's not just, oh, marijuana is haram, alcohol is haram, this is, just say haram and just stop. We have to really address addiction and understand addiction at a deep level. And part of that is having these type of events in our faith communities, in our masajid, but then to not just leave it at this so that we can also take it to the next level and have um, uh, support for our community in the masajid. There's a lot of churches that they have AA meetings. How many of you know what AA meetings are? Alcohol Anonymous, they have AA meetings and Narcotics Anonymous, which is the equivalent for addictions to narcotics, in, a, in the churches. Now, I want to ask you, how many of you know of a masjid that has an AA or an NA meeting in the masjid? Raise, raise your hand if you know. There's one in the Bay Area. There's a hint. It's the masjid in San Francisco under the leadership of Imam Abu Qadir al-Amin, who used to be on death row, and he was let out the one year when California overturned it, but he leads a community out there. They have a AA, um, uh, program in the masjid. There's a lot of hesitations from Muslims to, 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 to want to bring this into the masjid because, oh, you know, people are going to start talking. People are, but it's a real issue. People in our communities are, are, are experiencing this and we have to be able to, to have these conversations. So I'll just say three things. If we do start having them in our masajid, and I'm trying to advocate for even this masjid, this masjid, MCC, to start that, to start a support group for people dealing with addictions. A peer support group is just that. It's a peer. So what does that mean? Somebody who is a Muslim who has overcome addiction has to lead the group and help support in the group. We can get the education from, from the doctors, from the shield, from people who know about it from a, a technical side, but there's a lived experience of, edu of, of addiction that those peer support groups offer. So we have to have Muslims who have the courage to be able to come forth and say, I had an addiction, I overcame it, I'm willing to help out in a support group. That's one thing. Then we have to have the courage of the youth who are struggling with addictions to be able to say, I want, I want to be part of that group. Or the courage of the youth who may not be struggling with addiction, but they know somebody who's struggling with addiction or using it um, intermittently, which it can be uh, classified as an addiction depending on the number of factors. But to say, OK, I'm going to be the one who helps that person. And then thirdly, the families of the people who are struggling with addictions to have support groups for them because it's it's very difficult to go through that. Now, it might not seem relevant to people who are not experiencing that. But if you have had a family member go through addiction or somebody who's close to you, and I have had both. I've had family members and I've had people who are close to me go through addictions and struggle with addiction. And it's a very, very serious issue. Uh, one of the ways that I started working with Dr. Ahmed, Brother Justin, is a Muslim brother who his addiction actually led him, led him eventually, and this was a, a very practicing Muslim. It was through our program in, in the prison, and he was tahajjud and reciting Quran and reading, but when he got out, he fell back into his addiction, and it led him, he didn't want to reach out, and it eventually led him to an attempted suicide because he was so ashamed and did not want to reach out to the Muslim community because he was ashamed. Um, I have another family member who um, actually almost died of um, uh, uh, of alcoholism, and one who alcoholism was a was a serious contributing factor in his early death. Um, so I've seen it. I've seen. I've had students of mine who text me at 2 a.m. in the morning and say, "Sheikh, I can't go on like this anymore." Um, and I went into the mode of like, "Oh, is it? Is it? Is this a suicide? A call for help? Suicide?" But I come to find out, he's just struggling with his alcohol addiction. 
But what, what made me feel good is that I had that open, uh, enough of an open connection with him so that he would reach out to me in time of need, and then we tried to direct him to, to, to services that could help him. But the, the families have to be open. We can't shut down and just yelling and screaming and hitting and dealing with addiction. It's haram, and how can you do this? No, we have to understand addiction and deal with it and deal with it in a trained uh, uh, manner, having peer support groups for those struggling with addictions, the family and friends of those struggling with addictions, and then having our masajid open. So I look forward to this as a good sign that this masajid, this masjid can take a step forward um, in, that, uh, in that direction. Um, and this not just be a one-off discussion that we come, we hear about the, the issue, and then we move along. Thank you both. You know, Sheikh Rami and Dr. Ahmed both said something really important, which is the numbers. The numbers of people who are struggling and the numbers of how much this is essentially swept under the rug like so many other topics in our community that seem to be very stigmatized or difficult to speak about. But the reality is, and probably why the timing of a talk like this coming with around the time of the legalization of marijuana, there's been just a lot of confusion in the minds of people. If it is something that recreationally is legal and prohibited and, and uh, allowed, why are Muslims prohibiting it onto themselves? So there's a discussion, of course, there's the peer pressure and youth, but before we go to that, because there's actually some comments and questions that I'm going to pose to both of you, but before we go there is really understanding, you know, once, for those of you familiar with the Khalil Center, the counseling centers that we've opened up here in the Bay Area that are, you know, all Muslim therapists for Muslims dealing with Islamic spirituality, you would be surprised how many how many of the cases have come through that actually have either a direct issue with addictions or a side issue relating to addiction. It is a lot more prevalent in the community than anybody wants to admit. Dr. Ahmed said something really important, right? It was as we began, he said, just because we are Muslim doesn't mean we're going to be immune to any of the issues that surround the general population around us who are not Muslim. The only time we're immune is when we actually follow upon the rulings of the deen. And even then, we have to be very careful and protect ourselves, as he also mentioned. So people often are very much in denial about what exactly is going on in the community. And I can tell you, as the director and supervisor, that this apt of the Khalil Center, that this is absolutely something that we are dealing with daily, multiple times a day, all the time. So sticking our head in the sand isn't going to solve anything. And for those who are wondering why bring something like alcohol discussion and drug discussion into the masjid space because this should be a place where it's very open and we should be able to discuss these things in detail both from the scientific perspective but also from the dean perspective. Sheikh Rami said something very important here where he said about the parents and one of the comments that came out of the room when the youth came out, one of the things they immediately said was, I'm not going out there with the parents. Why would we want to talk about this with them? If we ever said anything about this, they'd immediately flip out. And I thought, mashallah. <laughs> the reality is, for many of us as parents and for many of the adults in the room, almost immediately the reaction to anything related to a topic like this is to just kind of blow your top. And because the children know that, the youth know that, they're just not willing to talk. So Sheikh Rami said, somebody will text him at 2 a.m. in the morning, and we have other of our, um, you know, brother Munir, sister Amina, some of the others who are around at the masjid who are trust, uh, trusting, uh, you know, adults that people can trust. They get these kind of messages and text messages all the time too. But what I really want to emphasize is the importance of the communication between parents and children. Like there is nothing that can substitute that aspect. And that if it's open enough and you may kind of do something like blow your top, and then have to kind of regroup again, brush yourself off, and try to have the conversation again. But if you don't, then it's always this black box, and the only other information that they get, a place where they get information from, is essentially their peers who are none the wiser than them. Right? So this is also a reason why it has to be kind of a very open discussion and communication, and I can't emphasize that enough. And it's not just about marijuana, it's not just about alcohol and drinking, it's not just about dating, it's not just about any really topic that you really feel uncomfortable talking about. If you get that feeling of un feeling uncomfortable, it's probably time to talk about it, right? It's exactly, you need to do the opposite of what that feeling is to make sure that it's addressed. Because whatever you're not filling in, someone else is, and it's just not helping. So 
I want to now pose a different question to Dr. Ahmed and Sheikh Rami and see what you think. One of the other questions was, so we understand that one or two puffs, <laughs> you know, may not necessarily make somebody addicted. But if that's the case, why not, why not just try? Like, what's the big deal? I don't intend to be someone who's addicted. I understand, I even understand it's haram. But what's one or two puffs? So just talking to our Muslim youth, I just, I'll let, I'll let Sheikh Rami kind of address the spiritual and Islamic aspect of that. And there's a lot, you know, that could be said about that. But just from the medical side of that, anytime we use substances and we experience substance use, it makes us vulnerable to continued substance use. And we know that when people use these harder drugs, oftentimes the gateway or the substance that precedes it is marijuana or cigarettes. And the best way to protect against that is to not engage in these activities and really just kind of understanding what context we're in. We're in a, we're in a drug kind of epidemic as a nation, an opioid epidemic, which it's largely driven by. And although you can't overdose off of cannabis, there's no reports for teens or adults overdosing on this, it's often the substance that precedes these really hard and heavy drugs. Leading cause of death in people under 50, is it car accidents, is it guns, is it gangs? No, it's drug overdoses. Drug overdose deaths have exceeded HIV uh, deaths at the peak of its epidemic, car accidents at the peak of its epidemic, and gun deaths at the peak of its epidemic. So we shouldn't snooze on it as a community. And cannabis is, is it's just not necessary. I mean, we can feel that feeling of well-being and that peace and that exhilaration through something that not everybody has, or maybe your community at school doesn't have. And that's, that's the dean, and that's the, everything that comes with that. So every reason that people use substances, you can put a pros and cons list to it. And all the pros that they use substances for, you can find that in other things, whether that be peer approval, whether that be like approval from your friends, whether that be a release, whether that be relaxation, whether that be just letting loose. All of that can be found in other things that don't have all the risks and consequences associated with it. Um, so, you know, it's really just about not being duped by all these messages that we're receiving in our society. It's really just about that and being able to achieve what other people achieve with cannabis through other, other things that aren't going to leave you uh, in the dust. Um, what I would say is that, and I mentioned this in both uh, sessions about the, the, some of the Sahaba asking the question, similar question, not the, the one puff question because marijuana or cannabis wasn't around at that time, but they were saying if, there, if it was an alcoholic drink that you would only get drunk by drinking a large amount, then what did the Prophet ﷺ say about that? That even a handful, even a handful would be haram. Um, and so somebody might, because somebody might think, well, I'm not going to drink the wine to get drunk. I'm just going to swish it around in my taste and, you know, uh, try to um, uh, taste some of those 250 flavor, what do they call it, flavoroids or what are the flavor compounds, which, by the way, coffee has 800. So if you're looking for that, uh, you know, taste, taste on the tongue, you know, co go for coffee. But uh, they might say, I'll just swish it around and spit it out, or I'm just going to drink a little bit, just a sip of beer or so forth. That was addressed by the Prophet Sallallahu If a large amount is going to intoxicate you, then a little bit is, um, is haram. And one of the reasons why is because that it's, a, it's not only is, is cannabis or marijuana a gateway drug to other drugs, but that one puff is a gateway to the use, the continued use of that. And so cutting off the gateways is a big part of our sharia. And um, the shaitan realizes this. And one of the, one of the tricks that he uses is to get people uh, accustomed some, to something incrementally. 
So it's just like people who want to abuse children. Um, if they if they just go straight up to the child and say, hey, come here, I want you know do this. Of course, the child's going to say no. But what do they do? They groom the person they're going to abuse them. Here's a piece of candy. So a person might say, well, what's wrong with that piece of candy? Well, that's the first step that's leading them to the end result. And that's the same exact way that the shaitan works. And they said that the, the, the likeness of the shaitan work is similar to the way the Arabs used to train their horses to cross the desert because they weren't able to go long distances without water. So they would hold water back from the horse for one day and then let it have water and get, get it used to that. One day off, one day on. And then two days off, one day on. And then three and then four and then five until they got the horse to where it could go six days without water and then they would cross the desert. So they said that's the way the shaitan works. He's not going to come up to you and say, hey, why don't you get, you know, get drunk and commit this and do this and do that. He knows for the believer that's not going to work. So he's got to start, start small. And he has his helpers and he has his logic and he has, he places that in. So that idea of, you know, belittling the one puff or the one sip is, um, is, 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 part of the, is part of those tricks and it's part of the, the a stepping stone to something that comes after them. So that was a question that actually came out of the room. Like that was a real question of, you know, after we had our first hour of discussion of the, the one puff, two puff question was actually something that was still on people's minds. So thank you both for kind of clarifying that more. Before I go on, I just want to say, does, do you guys know where the, um, behind you, the clipboard for the Cleo Center sign in? And on the sister side, do you guys have that? Can you guys keep passing that around? I think it's behind you there. Because of the, uh, I'll explain why towards the end about the programming that we're continuing to do and I want you all to know about it. So please make sure that it's continuing to go around and that you're um, going to be um, in, in tune with it, inshallah. So we use this word gateway quite a bit, a number of times. And we called marijuana a gateway drug a number of times, meaning that it will open the door potentially to other, more, uh, its own use at a more extensive level of leading to addiction and potentially to other harder and more difficult um, uh, drugs to eventually wean off of. And so then the question is about the one puff and two puff situation. Now we have to really understand there's a piece that we missed too that has to be explained. That you don't know if you're going to be the person who ends up getting addicted after the one puff or two puffs. You simply don't know. Just like alcohol. Somebody could drink and drink and drink and drink, and it's not until they're drinking like a fish, as they say, that they finally become an alcoholic. And the next person takes one sip or two sips, and they're an alcoholic for life. You don't know who you are. And you won't know until you try. So why try? So you need to understand this perspective too, right? For those of you, especially are, and honestly, it's not just the young people in the room. I have plenty of adult patients who I'm speaking to constantly about these things as well. Because again, of the legalization of cannabis, it's become very much a thing. People are using it, people are trying it, it's very much a recreational thing. You go watch the Super Bowl, everyone's smoking. It's, it's like, it's everywhere, right? So when I say this, it's not just to young, but it's also to old. And that's the question you have to ask yourself too. Do you know if you're going to be someone who very easily becomes addicted? You simply don't. Why take the chance? And I think that's what people have to keep in mind too. So there's this discussion of gateway. There's a discussion of hurma, right? The Sharia rulings. There's also a discussion of your bit, you're gambling with your health, essentially, right? And, and you all know then what happens when the doors continue to open and what comes next. So I think at this point, it would be very helpful to hear what other questions we have. So now that you've heard the discussions, both from uh, Sheikh Rami's perspective and Dr. Amr's perspective, my guess is there's probably some more questions out there and we have the mics kind of going around for those questions. So let's take a couple of those from the audience inshallah. We'll do sisters first. Just raise your hand sisters. Hello? Okay, sorry. Um, so I've had a question from like the doctor's perspective. So what if you have a patient that you know that could benefit from marijuana? Do you take the religious aspect of it or do you take like the aspect of medicine? Like I do think, like for example, you gave the example, um, for example, you said about the person who has, their muscles are really tough, so they take like marijuana to like decrease that. So what do you think if you're a doctor, you describe, like you prescribe your patients, should you do it or should you not? I think the Islamic aspect and the medical aspect are really in harmony. 
And just looking at it from the medical aspect, there are a, a couple of conditions that have an adequate amount of medical evidence behind it. One is chronic pain. One is uh, muscle spasticity from specific conditions like multiple sclerosis. And the third is, um, is uh, nausea and vomiting from chemotherapy. So they're very specific conditions. Now, just because some treatment has evidence for it doesn't mean we use it in the medical community. It also has to be weighed against the risks associated with it. And since we know cannabis has so many risks to, to the mind, to the mental health, it's associated with anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, it's associated with um, low educational attain attainment, you, you know, inattention, and all types of verbal memory. It just it makes you slow, basically. And so since it has all these risk factors, we don't use it as a first line. And if you look at so two things I'll bring up before, I don't want this to get too long. Two things I'll bring up is number one, there, all of those conditions have first line medications, second line medications, and oftentimes third line medications. That's number one. Number two, there are synthetic forms of these medications that are FDA approved. Because by the way, cannabis is a Schedule One drug, which means it's not approved for medical use on the federal level. And there's Schedule Three cannab cannabinoid drugs that are FDA approved to use um, for nausea, vomiting, for pain. Um, and so that, that's number two. And then number three, when I say evidence, um, it's not. So that, those are what the major synopses of these this uh, the literature say out there. But when I say evidence, these are small studies. I'm, I'm sorry, not small studies. These are short studies. So we don't really know what the effect is in the long run. And we really have to understand that from our history, we've made mistakes as a nation in the past by rushing towards things without really understanding what the effects are. Like, for example, nicotine is a, is a prime example. In the 40s and 50s, you could see doctors advertising and endorsing cigarettes. You could see them in prestigious medical journals, advertisements for cigarettes. Um, and then what happens 10, 20 years later? Oops. And then there's um, uh, statements put out, and now it's the number one leading preventable cause of death. We have an opioid epidemic, which was, you know, the, the short of the story, which was kind of prompted by copious amount of opioids prescribed by doctors. So I, I don't want to, doctors are important. I'm a doctor. You should listen to your doctor. But, you know, we should really understand that we don't want to rush into decisions. And the medical community is behind this, that there's evidence for these three, three issues, that there's first-line medications to use, that there's FDA-approved medications to use, and then finally, the last important point, and I'll kind of close it, this question with this, is that when I say evident, there's adequate evidence for these conditions, what they use in the study are very minuscule amounts of marijuana. At most, the guidelines say one, one puff off of a very weak type of marijuana, which is about 8 to 9% THC. What do we have out now? It's 20, 25% THC. And all this stuff you see on billboards where cannabis improves anxiety on the billboards on the highway or, or I don't know, wherever else you see it, it's, um, we really need to uh, recognize that these aren't messages and ideas that are being promoted by the metal community. And then ideas don't gain currency because they're logical or because they're based by science, they gain currency because they're advertised well and because there's a lot of money to be made off of it. And there's a lot of money to be made off of cannabis. And we, we, we should recognize that. And again, a lot of this is just not being duped and looking back 10 years from now and saying, oh, I shouldn't have jumped on that bandwagon. Other questions? Yes. This one. Okay, so I had an imam, a Bay Area imam, tell me something a while ago that I thought was very interesting, and I just wanted to ask you about it if, 
if you've heard this in your research or your work with the community as well, he said that he's finding um, more and more young Hufad in the community who believe marijuana is okay to use and they will lead prayers and give khutbahs and at the same time think it's okay to, to smoke uh, marijuana. And he said that with many of them, the introduction to that whole culture came through the hookah and the shisha culture, that environment. Have you heard that? And also, Islamically, if you can give a little bit of the perspective towards the hookah and shisha culture, which a lot of young people are into for, you know, hanging out with friends. Yep, absolutely. So, yes, in short, the answer is yes. We have seen this epidemic and a phenomenon like you described exactly. So, um, and you would think, Hafad, really, the ones who are leading us in Sarawih and such. Um, but remember, this is... The, again, Dr. Ahmed mentioned the thing about logic. <laughs> it's not always logical. Like so many people will talk about nicotine in the same way. They would talk about, like you said, the shisha hookah in the same way. And saying, well, it's not really haram. So therefore, this is a way to socialize and enjoy our, our time together. So have we seen the phenomenon? And is it, is it a phenomenon? I would say absolutely it is. Now I'll, I'll leave the um, discussion of what do you say sharan? Uh, yeah, I'm smiling because I've heard the logic behind that. The um, the finding of fatwa, you know, the fatwa shopping to be able to to, to start that. Um, I will say just as a note on the the smoking that that is a like a gateway to marijuana would be smoking. So that's something we have to understand in our in our communities um, nationwide and ummah wide. Like Muslims smoke a lot. One of the first things that during the Iraq embargo. Along with medicine that America was preventing to go into Iraq was tobacco. Like they wanted to strangle the nation, so they said food, medicine, and tobacco. We're not sending it in. That's how much of a, a, a hold it has on the, the culture. So we really have to start pushing um, uh, away the, 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 the smoking culture from our communities because it is a gateway. And then the shisha, of course, now because the, the smell is reduced and people say, oh, the... The, the bubbles will take away the nicotine and this, you know, the ice will take away. I mean, they have all of these urban legends about their why it's not an issue, but it, it, it does, it's a, or that doesn't have nicotine, yeah. It, it, uh, it's a gateway into like normalizing, oh, like uh, the, the smoking, because one of the issues with shahwa in general uh, desires is that once you get used to one thing, you want to start something else. And that's why uh, confining uh, shahwa or desires within the halal, Allah will put barakah to where a person is content with that desire within, within the realms of the halal. Once a person goes into outside, which it even has a different name, it's called the hawa, the desires that go outside of the sharia, Allah doesn't put barakah in, in that. And so the person just has to go keep on, keep on, keep on until they get something. And that's why when, when people start using drugs and alcohol, they have to start using something harder and harder and harder. And they want to get a different buzz and they want to give a different feeling. In terms of the, the fatwa or where they might be getting, and it's interesting you're saying, you know, it's from Hafaz because they might have some of these discussions like the Sharia based discussions. And it's important for us to know this, the, the history behind the fatwas of uh, cannabis or marijuana or hashisha in Arabic or benja had different names, but it was introduced later in time. So it wasn't it wasn't at the early time of the Sahaba and the Salaf to where some grand Sahabi could say, oh, I've been introduced to hashisha, marijuana, and it is haram. It came later. And so it was introduced later. And so when it first was introduced to the Muslims, they had they were they were uh, trying to figure out what's going on. To give you an example, in some areas when coffee was first introduced to those Muslim lands, they said it was haram because they would drink coffee or tea. So I've seen fatwas that are old that when they say um, they, they drink tea, they're like, oh, this affects the, like, he probably got like some really strong tea and it started giving him, so, so he's like, this is affecting my intellect, you know, something's happening. They couldn't really describe what's going on, so they're like, oh, this is haram. Great scholars, great scholarship. He was basing the hukum on his understanding of, of, of the ruling. So the same thing happens when they were introduced to uh, hashisha um, or marijuana or whatever, by uh, a bud, by ever, any other name is still a bud. Um, when they were introduced to this, the, some of them you will find in some of the fatwa works, oh, they, there's not a problem with this. But the problem is, is if we stick on the letter of the law, okay, this, this fatwa says it's okay, this fatwa says it's not okay, but what are those two scholars in agreement about? They're in agreement that in, if it intoxicates you, if it affects your intellect, it is haram. It was just they were differing on whether or not this actually affects you. 
And so some, some of the early scholars would say, well, you know, some people say, oud, because when you smell incense, you know, it kind of relaxes you, so it's kind of like that. But they really didn't understand that. Now, I would say, I would ask anybody, Dr. Ahmed is here, a specialist in addiction, can, can somebody logically make a, a connection between incense and marijuana today and be taken seriously in the medical field? They're not. So even if, you, if somebody comes and says, I have a fatwa from 1583 from the great scholar who said uh, cannabis is permissible, are we going to say, come on, you know, it's like earlier I was saying that there were, there, there are people that would, um, well, the hadith mentioned that there were earlier generations when the meat, the flesh of the swine was made prohibited. What did they start doing? Eating the lard. They're like, oh, well, it doesn't say, you know, well, that's the, the point of the ruling is that, that, that thing is haram. As a, encapsulated, understand that. What makes something haram is that its ability to be intoxicated. So in any other culture, like for example, in Mongolia, they would drink fermented mare's milk. They would get the horse's milk, ferment it, and drink it. Is somebody going to say, well, that's not alcohol. That's, um, uh, that's not haman. That's not pressed from wine. But its end result is that it, it can affect you. But even those early fatwas that, 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 uh, that say they allow for it, they were just talking about the amount that it would not affect your intellect. So they're talking about they were exposed to weed, marijuana, six, seven hundred years ago. The strains that we have today and the ability to analyze the levels of THC in them, their stuff, one puff, am I right? Is it, it's going to, yeah, so, you want to yeah. talk about the... Yeah, absolutely. I don't want to cut you off because you're making great points. But yeah, this, there's old cannabis and there's new cannabis. Cannabis in the 70s, 80s, 5% THC. Cannabis now is 25%, so much stronger. And then we have these weird synthetic can cannabinoids that are 100 times stronger, K2 and spice. So, yeah, absolutely. And then wine in the olden days and hard liquor relatively in the wine, wine and hard liquor. So wine relative to the history of alcohol, hard liquor is a, a new phenomenon. So there's, there are newer ways of making these substances and really the new substances, although they, they really don't resemble in a lot of ways in terms of the strength of what the old substances were. Please go ahead. So I'll end on this. It's kind of funny note. So I was actually discussing the same point with somebody who was trying to argue with me. Oh, there's not an issue. I said, brother, you say shrimp is haram, but marijuana is not like what's going on there. Like this dean is, you know, it's made for, for, for intellectual reflection and to see when there's a, when there's a, when there's a clear, like lack of congruence in, in things and balance. Like we have to, we have to understand um, that if, if something does affect the intellect and all of the, the literature says that that's, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck and sounds like a duck, it's a duck, right? Our apologies to the Hanafis. <laughs> mashallah. All right, mashallah. So I realize we're coming close to the end of the timing of the program, and there probably are several more questions. I will we'll take one more we can on the take brother's as side. Inshallah. A couple okay. more. Inshallah. Yeah. Yes. There's. Yes, uh -huh. on the brother's side. Inshallah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I was just hoping you could address what, uh, what is CBD oil how it's used, what it is, and um, I've heard that it doesn't affect children or under the age of 21, so maybe you could just provide some insight on that. Just a little bit. Sure. Yeah, so there's the cannabis plant, then there's molecules in the plant. It's THC, CBD. THC is the stuff that is psychoactive and affects the intellect. CBD doesn't. However, it's very hard to extract the CBD from the plant purely. And you'll have, um, so in my sort of, on the clinical side, in my clinical experience, we have a lot of patients that come in, they go into recovery, stop using all substances, and they'll use CBD oil. And this is probably the most um, clear evidence, but they'll take your drug screens and THC will show up. So it's very hard to extract the CBD plant. And then we have to recognize that all, none of the, this isn't regulated. So you're not getting this as a medication that's FDA approved or from like that's over the counter. It's, it's probably at some shop um, and it's maybe from a source that you really can't verify exactly what's in it or may not be consistent medication. Medic that's not to say that um, 
that there aren't some benefits to molecules, whether it be CBD, THC, or what. It's just to recognize that we always have to weigh the benefits versus the risks. And oftentimes, people use this for conditions that they're suffering with. And I understand that. And people go, let's say, for example, for pain. And people undergo a lot of suffering. So we have, we have a chronic burden of pain in our nation as well. So people undergo a lot of suffering. We should understand that and look at their unique perspective and try to educate them medically and see if there's other things that can be used. And then also, just a point on that with these, with these young hafad, we have to really understand, you know, there's a lot of shame and stigma around substance use. And when the shame and stigma is really compounded, uh, we get all these strange justifications and loose justifications in the mind that are sort of retroactively made. And, you know, we, we got to understand these, 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 these young people are kind of put on a pedestal from a young age. And then they're not allowed to make mistakes. And then memorizing the Quran is so stressful in itself and reviewing it. And it's, it's like you have to keep doing that. We should really um, have a place for them to, to be able to, 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 to open up and, and talk about this. So yeah, there's justifications that are made. A lot of times it's um, just a reaction to how they have to make this all fit in their mind. Thank you. Okay. My question is, obviously there is a technical definition of what an addiction is. But what is addiction? When we say addicted to X, Y, Z thing, what does addiction mean? The second part of the question is, I've had conversations with many folks who always say that they drink alcohol, but they never feel it just because they have a certain high level of tolerance. Does that come under addiction, like, or does that even apply to cannabis or any of these things? So in my field, addiction has a very concrete definition. It's based on 11 criteria. In, in, in a, it, basically, it means a loss of control over people's substance use and continued use despite consequences. The, the main distinction that's made and the main confusion that occurs is there's dependence that your body can have on a medication or a molecule. You're, you can become dependent to heart medications. You can become dependent on some anti on, on certain antidepressants. That doesn't necessarily mean, or we don't consider that to be addiction. What we continue, consider to be addiction is not a, a physical dependence on a, a substance, but rather a behavioral maladaptation, a behavioral problem, which is a result of changes that occur in the brain from prolonged use of of drugs and alcohol. And these changes that occur in the brain are well documented, well established, and um, result into predictable behaviors. Um, and that's, that's what we consider addiction. So just kind of simplifying it, we consider addiction a loss of control and life becomes unmanageable, continued use despite consequences, and just a preoccupation with using substances on the mind. And it's a medical problem that has medical treatment. And then there's also substance use that people, people use substances regularly, like alcohol or marijuana. We don't necessarily call that addiction. And they might not be at a place where they would be able to commit to the treatments that are required for people who are addicted, because they can be sometimes intensive. But they have a regular pattern of substance use. And there's a lot that be, can be done for them as well. Um, and, and these two groups are addressed in my world somewhat differently. Um, and we have different tools in our toolbox to deal with them. Um, I hope that answers. And then alcohol, yes, your body can become dependent on it. You can get a tolerance to it to the point where alcohol doesn't affect you as much. And alcohol, alcohol affects different people differently based on their weight and uh, their ability to metabolize it. Affects men differently than women, so on and so forth. We have a couple more questions. Um, 
and I realize that time is getting short, so I'm going to take in all of those two questions. But I want to say, in case we don't get the chance before many people start to leave, for those who are starting to wonder, okay, great, now what? So the now what I think we should address before the couple of questions, which is the now what of clearly if yourself, your family member, a loved one, a friend is going through any of these and feels that sense of shame or stigma and not really wanting to get help, please know that help is readily available. Alhamdulillah, at the Khalil Center, we have folks who counsel and work on addictions. Also, that Dr. Amr here, inshallah, is working on a platform for the education of people who have addiction issues and their families and loved ones on understanding this process more in a support group type fashion. And that we're also working with the MCC, who has been a fantastic partner to the Khalil Center in having a group, inshallah, soon actually on site as well. So in individual work, in group work, whether you look at it from the medical perspective or the, the dean perspective, and I should also mention that Sheikh Rami has uh, religious counseling sessions he offers here too. And once you remarked to me that so many of the hours you spend in counseling have addiction stories to them. So whether it's coming from this perspective or that perspective, it's a very much a real issue, but know that there is help. Professional help, dean help, it's here, inshallah ta'ala. And that's, I want to just make that shout out again and know that the sign up sheets are around. For those who want to stay in touch and know how to actually get that assistance, the Khalil Center is here to help and the information's in the back. I'm going to take another question from the sister side and we have one more from our youth side as well, as well inshallah. I'll repeat the question. Sister's asking, is there anything being done about the advertising that's all through the billboards up and down the highways and such? Is there any sort of regulation happening around advertising? Unfortunately, commercial advertising is included in uh, our constitutional rights, like free speech. Um, so it's very hard to um, fight against advertising. So once it's become legalized, it's very hard to to fight against that. I mean, there's we can start pushing back on where they can advertise, and it, it's not it, it's no longer about legalization versus not legalization anymore, but to really partic participate in the discussion of exactly how we're going to allow this to be legalized, how we're going to allow it to be advertised, who it can be advertised to, how we're going to tax this, where that money goes. And all these problems are being thought about by the people who are going to make a lot of money off of this because every decision is going to be millions of dollars um, for them. And it's something that, you know, if, if we have it in our, if we're moved to, we should also think about it and fight the power, fight, fight against this. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll just add one more point and then we'll take the question is that this is it's also calls in a greater issue that we should as our families uh, be discussing just marketing and advertising and propaganda and understanding that and, and pointing out things as they're advertised. So if, if, you're, if you're watching TV and commercials come on, I mean, try to avoid those commercials in, in general because that's what that's the meat of the, the program. It's not the program. The programming is the, is the commercials. Uh, but then also break that down for your, 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 your families, whether it's the toys, whether it's the, uh, the, the restaurants, whether you see billboards on the side of buses, you know, point stuff out because their kids are seeing it, but point it out and start understanding the media tricks and what they what, what goes on behind that and the power of corporations and start uh, start uh, immunizing uh, our families against that. We had a question from the uh, young brother. Okay, um, good thing it works. Um, will, th will there ever be like an alternative, like a healthier alternative, maybe in the future or yeah, you mean a healthier alternative to marijuana? Yes, and it exists now. It's called fulfilling family relationships. It's called mindfulness, exercise, eating healthily. So all these things really contribute to us feeling well. Marijuana releases a feel-good chemical in your brain in high amounts, and that feel-good chemical can be released through a lot of natural ways, playing letting loose with friends, playing sports. 
participating in team sports, exercise, all these things, exercise is a good one, releases these chemicals on demand. If we, if we all sort of jumped up, st stood up into jumping jacks right now, those feel good chemicals would be pumping. Uh, so yes, it exists and it's in a neighborhood near you. Um, I'd also like to add on that point is that um, there are other solutions and it's important for us to understand addiction. Like as, if anybody's interested in um, one of the things that we've been doing at the Playba Foundation, because we deal with a lot of people who have addictions, who are incarcerated either because of their addictions or things that they did while, uh, while under the, the influence of, of, of substances, we're working on programs to, to address addiction and, and address substance use and abuse. And, um, and that's actually, uh, mashallah, Dr. Ahmed has been gracious with um, his time in reviewing some of the work that some of our students are producing. Muslim students, there's Muslims in prison who are at the forefront of leading, of, facili of creating and facilitating um, drug awareness groups, substance abuse, uh, therapeutic com communities, and so forth. And so it's forced me to learn a lot about, um, uh, about drug use and about the cycle of behavior around it and, uh, and addiction in general. And I really encourage us as a community to understand that. Um, uh, and one thing that was, uh, one, one person said, he said that the drugs are not, it's not the problem. It's the solution to the problem. It's just the wrong solution. So when we look at marijuana, we might see that the problem is the marijuana user, the alcohol user, the gambling use. But it's actually in, in response to something else going on in that person's life, whether it's a genetic predisposition towards addiction or towards using something or uh, emotional issues or uh, stress uh, like the stressors that the Dr. Ahmed was mentioning about in the HIPAA programs, the stressors of, a, of, a, of, of trying to maintain a 4.3, which I don't even understand how you get beyond a 4.0. Um, but all of those stressors, so, under, so going, peeling back the layers and trying to understand what is it the root cause that is that the problem that is leading this person to use uh, a substance as a solution, and um, and so to dig deeper. And so there, there, the uh, there, is, the encouragement is that we should understand it, and then it'll also help us understand just addictions in general. We might, we as as believers, we know people can be addicted to the dunya and various aspects of the dunya. And so understanding addiction, there's a lot of correlation between the, 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 the pathways and the choices people make to lead towards addiction to substances and addiction to other aspects of the dunya. Mashallah. Clearly weren't around when I was in school. What's that? <laughs> he doesn't know what a 4.3 is. No, I know what it is. I mean, it's 105% on the test. It's a good thing you were, we were past that stage. Alhamdulillah. All right. The, um, we have another question, inshallah, on the sister side. Assalamu alaikum. So I had two burning questions. The first one is, are you able to give us two to three signs as parents that would help us recognize at an early stage that if our youth is doing that? And the second question is, what do you think as parents we should do about the public school system that has failed us? Because there is nothing they really doing to help this uh, drug problem out of the school system. So, so signs. One advice that I heard that I feel is valuable is when kids come home from school, just to spend some time talking with them, debriefing them, and doing it in a non-judgmental, warm, compassionate way, trying to keep a connection and a dialogue going. And if something comes up, like maybe an interaction or something that may be a little frightening for us as parents because we give up a lot of control when they go to school and they have to make a lot of decisions on their own, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't get too frightened by that or um, make that a disruption to that, those lines of communication because uh, – Big picture is to keep that dialogue going and those lines of communication open. Um, to continue a conversation so that you can help assist them in making decisions and not make decisions for them. And a lot of this is just recognizing how little control we have over this. Uh, this meaning just our children and um, focusing on the areas we do have control over. Um, and um, signs, 
you could probably find online, you know, signs for cannabis use, um, like red eyes and personality changes and changes in friends, staying out late, um, things like that. And inevitably, when substance use kind of gets out of control, there will always be some sort of tell. Life becomes unmanageable. And then grades is a big one, changes in school performance. All those things are indicators that something's not right. But the hope is, is that there's lines of communication open so we can catch that. And we can almost conceptualize it as maybe a missed, uh, maybe dropping the ball. Or if we don't catch that, those changes in school performance, changes in friends, before catching that in our conversations with them um, as parents. And um, yeah, at some, yeah. And, and then public schools, you know, I, I couldn't really comment too much on that because I, I, just don't, I just don't know. But I, I would imagine that, you know, school systems are different, public schools are different. Um, so I, I would imagine it wouldn't hurt by just getting involved and getting a pulse for what the school's like and seeing where you can help out um, in changing things at school. And certainly if there's like a drug problem at its school, then people should come together and think about how to, to, uh, to prevent that and, and create like a prevention program to strengthen factors associated, uh, factors that are protective of substance use and factors that are, um, to reduce factors that are associated with substance use. Reduce factors that are associated with substance use. Do we have any other questions at this time? Anything on the side, brother side? MashaAllah. So we want to thank again the MCC very much for putting in what I think is a very much innovative, positive, good innovation, inshallah, uh, taking the step to do a program like this. To be honest, the show that was here tonight I think speaks to the need. But also I want to say some years ago uh, another masjid had actually reached out and wanted to do a similar programming and actually called the program, the lecture, what it is. They actually called it drug addiction. And one person showed up. <laughs> one. So the difference between the numbers tonight and the numbers just even, I think this might have been on the order of five years ago, not terribly long ago, means that A, there is more awareness and more willingness to have the discussion, which I see as a positive, inshallah, insight, because you can't, you can't actually make headway unless you're going to take a discussion head on and tackle it head on. And B, that there is just more prevalence and more need to actually have this discussion, particularly with the confusion of what happens with something that's legalized, but is still, just like alcohol, but is still prohibited by the dean. So inshallah, I hope this was a good discussion launching pad. Please hear me very much when I say, please have these discussions with each other in the home together children and parents, youth and adults together, because this is the only time that information, misinformation can get corrected. Of course, inshallah, we are here as resources, Dr. Ahmed and myself, and also Sheikh Rami. So from the physician perspective, from the uh, spiritual leaders perspective, and also from the institutional perspective, like Khalil Center as a resource to you. So we're around, inshallah, for any questions, and hopefully look out for our programming, both on our email list, but also on our social media handles, and inshallah, you benefit from that uh, kind of work, and you may keep us in your du'as, all of us, inshallah ta'ala. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.